As it is currently the month of May in these parts, a month in which many Norwegians dress up in their regions, or families regions, Bunad to celebrate the 17th of May, our National Day of Independence, which is a big deal trademark around here. I thought perhaps I would explore a bit around the origins of the Bunads as we know and love them today. The story we are being told is that these clothes, or bunad, are what Norwegians wore historically before we all started wearing jeans and t-shirts or something. But is that entirely true? Prepare yourselves, fair viewer, because we are about to embark on a journey that may or may not stir a few trolls from their slumber, because in Norway, the bunad is something of a religion to a lot of people. The term bunad comes from the Old Norse bunadr, with the root bu meaning home, and the ending turning it into equipment for the home. It was not until the end of the 1800s that we started to talk about kleda bunad, or garment bunad, later shortened to just bunad to mean customs around dress, particularly the Sunday best of rural and farming parts of Norway that were considered pure and untouched by fashions of places like London and Europe. Some of the earliest documented interest into how regular people dressed around the country came around the mid-18th century, when trade routes around the country were being more properly documented, and some of the different dress customs were also documented along the way. A fan favorite right from the start has always been, and still is, the Hardanger Bunald, who ended up being a sort of ideal to what the one true Norwegian aesthetic looked like for the movement to come. It is important to point out that the rising interest in rural Norwegian dress, music, dance and culture towards the end of the 19th century did not happen in a vacuum. It is strongly linked to the national romanticism movement that sprung up from around 1830 to 1870, but especially as a reaction to liberating ourselves from Denmark in 1814. This meant that there was increased interest in identifying a national personality separate from other nations, you know, to justify us being our own nation or something. This had severe, devastating effects on any culture not deemed the national majority of a country, which I have touched briefly upon in my other video about Sami history and the Lukka, if you care to learn more about that. So we have a backdrop and an agenda behind wanting to emphasize everything that was seen as especially Norwegian and to downplay anything that wasn't. And this was the environment in which we find our first Bunad pioneer, dancer, suffragist and writer, Hulda Garborg. Garborg's entry into dress customs came through her interest in traditional rural song and dance, for which you, obviously, needed appropriate attire in which to dance in. This became the start of a lifelong dedication to traveling around Norway to take inspiration from the art and the clothing people wore. From that she developed more or less loosely inspired national outfits or bunads, several of which are still in use today. But Garborg didn't set out to preserve what she saw exactly. She changed, adapted and altered the outfits to fit the politics and beauty standards of the time. The big focus on emphasizing the real and true Norwegian cultures and ideals meant that, for instance, that the common practice of splurging on a small piece of beautiful imported fabric or ribbon, such as velvet, with which to adorn your clothes, could end up getting replaced with Norwegian wool embroidery instead. Culture does not exist in a vacuum, though. If you have a beautiful silk ribbon unlike anything around you, you'll want to show that off. And people in the past were no different. Never mind that we have evidence at least as far back as the Vikings of long-distance trade in the form of silk and rice. But that kind of exchange was not in line with the politics at the time, so... 
There was also no custom among the Bunad enthusiasts at the time of dressing according to one's region or even a single region at a time. Garborg herself is famously depicted wearing a beltestak or a sort of dress or skirt with suspenders from Hallingdal with a short jacket from Telemark and possibly a sölje or specific type of silver jewelry from Trøndelag or Romsdal. Bunad historians joke that she should have worn a headdress from Hardanger as well, just to really top it all off. After Garborg, one of the next big names in Bunad history is Clara Sem, who represents a shift in mindset around the Bunad. Sem attended dancing courses with Garborg and later continued to travel, gather and teach music, dance and Bunad traditions. But where Garborg intended to bring the Bunad into the modern age, Sem was more interested in understanding and documenting the traditions as they were. And we see the shift towards keeping an entire outfit in line with the customs of a single region, which is still the norm today. Sem wished to keep as much of the original culture around the dress as possible, and her work was closer to what we today might consider reconstructions although she still took some artistic liberties where there was not enough material left to reconstruct an entire bunad. Sem considered it especially important to get rid of the hideous modernized bunads and to spread real timeless bunads, showing two very different mindsets when approaching and creating bunads. At the same time as Clara Sem, we also find Anne Bamle, a Buna seamstress from East Telemark who falls more in line with Garborg's line of thinking, but where Garborg and Sem traveled to regions they were unfamiliar with, Bamle focused on the areas of her native East Telemark, visiting farms to see old garments. In this way, she documented scores of different embroideries and variations of embroidery, and she always made small changes to every new buna that she made, showing an understanding of the creative process that was involved, having grown up in the area herself. But she did also modernize the bunads, as in the example of what Bamle called the Heddal bunad, but has these days come to be known as the Bamle East Telemark bunad. In some of the photographs from the time, we can see women dressed in a beltestak that reaches under the bust and is kept in place by a really wide tablet woven band sitting directly underneath said bust. What embroidery we can see is limited to the decorative Sunday best apron, and what little we can see of the bottom of the stuck seems to be decorated with ribbon. And there may or may not be a prevalence for colorful printed fabrics for shirts. In Bumle's modernized version, the suspenders have been widened to also cover the bust, the tablet woven band is narrower and closer to the natural waist, the shirt is white, and there is a lot more embroidery all over the bunad, all in the same style. There had been a tradition for richly embroidered broadcloth stockings in East Telemark, but Bamle moved this embroidery to the apron and stuck, and the original stockings were replaced with simple knitted ones. Richly embroidered mittens and gloves were also common. You know, small things that you probably have a spare of, so you can take the time in between other work to decorate it. This is just one example but it is a rather typical one, with adaptations meant to make people feel more comfortable and attractive in their bunad according to their modern beauty standards if the dress customs of the area did not adhere to them already. By now, bunad culture is richly embedded in the Norwegian identity. It became more important that all regions at have at least one bunad, than that the bunad was accurate to what the people in these regions actually wore in the past. One of the most beloved and often voted prettiest bunad in the country, the Norlands bunad for instance, has the entirety of its embroidery design based on the embroidery of a single pocket and bringeklut, which is something akin to a stomacher. 
Nulan is an area where clothing retained a high value well into the 20th century, and several wills specified who gets what, as a good coat could mean the difference between life and death. It makes sense, then, that we wouldn't find a lot of unused pieces of clothing hiding away in attics to develop bunots from. With all this in mind, bunot today are classified into five different categories. The first category is for bunots that represent uh, the last link in a continuous tradition from daily dress to bunot, where rich source material is available to draw from and people still wear and know how to wear the garments when the bunot was designed. The second category is for bunots where the daily dress culture had fallen away, but there was still a significant amount of source material available in old chests and drawers, as well as people who still remembered how the garments were made and worn. In the third category, traditional wear has been forgotten by the region, and significant research is required to reconstruct an assumption of what was worn and how through old garments, written sources and pictures. In the fourth category, there are no preserved garments to study or so few or so different garments that it is impossible to know what was most common. There is no complete outfit to copy and conjecture must be used to put together an entire outfit. In the fifth and last category, we find bunals that have been more or less freely inspired by clothing or other crafts, such as wood carving, specific painting styles, silver work or even something the region is famous for. It is in categories 4 and 5 that we find most of the common and popular bunals today, and we are unlikely to get any new bunals in categories 1 and 2 at this point, simply because what source material is available to develop such things is probably, hopefully, already catalogued in a museum. Categories 4 and 5 are also where there is some discussions in the Bunad environment, where many Bunad Puritans do don't consider these to be Bunads at all, but would rather they were called Festtracht, or Special Occasion Garb, to keep the word Bunad pure, especially for those few Bunads in categories 1 and 2 who must never change. Ever. Because people in the past never changed. Right? This kind of frozen-in-time view on culture and traditions honestly makes me a bit sad, and it has been a big deterrent to my own interest in exploring the dress traditions from my own country. The whole industry just seems really intimidating from the outside, not to mention terribly gatekeepy. The courses you are required to attend to make a bunad and the materials you need to buy in order to make one are really quite expensive. More, of course, if you have someone else make it for you, not to mention all the silver that goes with it. The cost of a bunad often lies somewhere between 20 to 50,000 Norwegian kroner, or around 2 to 6,000 US dollars, and some can be close to twice that. The upside, though, being that a bunad is considered appropriate attire for just about every formal occasion you can think of from baptism and weddings to graduations and even meeting royalty. But the same one true wayism that provides only a small handful of variations with each bunad, which of course is presented at look at all the amazing choices that you have, is also sad for a different reason, and that is how we lose all the beautiful variation that is evident in the historical material that I really think adds life and personality to the outfits. People in the past were not all uniformed carbon copies of each other, and I think some of the beauty is lost when that variation is not brought more clearly into the future. It also bears to mention that the Sami Gakti and clothing tradition does not fall under this strict regime, as it is one of the only clothing traditions in Norway that were never broken, as there were always some Sami wearing Gakti for their daily garments, and an increasing number of younger Sami are picking this back up again. As a living culture, they keep playing with color, texture and materials, which is exactly the kind of playfulness I wish we still enjoyed with our own dress history, without saying it can only be called a special occasion garb, because it is not a real bunad. Though, as we have explored in this video, 
most of the Bunans we do have today were interpretations made by people, usually, though not always, not from the specific region in question, and inspired by customs a hundred years or more in their past. So what say you to perhaps the occasional exploration of small pieces of Norwegian dress history on this channel? It will be more in line with a more liberal interpretation of the original pioneers, though, because adaptive living history is much more fun, and I was never much good at following a recipe exactly to the letter. But also because I just cannot, with the fact that we are shamed if we do not faithfully copy the bunads made and designed by people who often just did whatever the heck they wanted, because tradition. Am I right? 